Uh, my name is Chris Pike. Um, I, um, as mentioned, I'm Autism Access Specialist for the National Autistic Society, uh, and I have been for the past month. Um, so I work on um, ensuring, working with businesses, venues, cultural performances, etc., um, to making them uh, autism friendly, uh, to making them as accessible as possible for autistic people and their families and friends. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about that, but mainly I'll be talking about myself, my own experience, and the experiences I've learned from other autistic people. I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome when I was 14, I'm now 23, and I've been traveling uh, in my hometown, up in the northwest, uh, both before and after diagnosis in Oxford, where I went to university, and now London, where I've been living for the past year. So, um, just to run, I know a lot of you will already know a lot about autism, so I'm going to make this really quick, um, but autism is a lifelong developmental condition. Um, it's a spectrum, which means that every person is different. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that term. It doesn't mean that it's some sort of uh, long line with mild here and serious here. What it means is that there's lots of different aspects to autism and everyone will be affected by different aspects of it. So some people may never be affected by one particular area, but really affected by another. And then it could be the vice versa for someone else. Um, there's an estimated 700,000 children and adults with autism in the UK. Uh, so that's at least one in 100 people. Um, the three key areas of difference that we think about um, when it comes to making places autism friendly or autism accessible um, are around social communication and interaction, the difficulties that can happen there, the challenges of, of communicating, of picking up social cues, etc. Um, restricted interests, um, which doesn't necessarily mean less interest, it just might mean that there's a bigger focus on specific uh, special focuses on which one may have a lot of personal knowledge. Um, there may be limitations in social imagination, being able to put yourself in a situation that's different to one you've been in before, even if to a neurotypical person that situation might seem quite similar to something they've done before. Um, and sensory differences, so autistic people can be both hyper and hyposensitive, uh, and often both um, to all senses, noise, light, um, touch. The key thing to remember about autism is that it is a spectrum, which means that everyone is different, and there are a variety of different means, uh, different experiences, and different needs. What that means from my perspective is that my job is quite hard because when we want to make things as accessible as possible for autistic people, that's not just a simple checklist, um, but it is really important to think about that whole plethora of issues that you'll need to be thinking about when thinking about autistic people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience of public transport now. And as I mentioned, I've lived in three different places uh, with three quite different experiences. Um, and also, of course, over that 10 years, as has already been mentioned, there's been a lot of innovation. So I may be making judgments about the places and saying, well, isn't London great, which I know a lot of people are saying, and it's probably quite annoying. But from it could also just be that I've only lived here for a year, and so much progress has been made in that time. Um, so, things that are good about public transport, things that make my life easier, things that make me less anxious, that's things like information on the web, uh, so it's been mentioned about apps, but also being able to access that information through a website, um, being able to find out arrival times, information on stations, uh, how to pay and prices. So some of that information, things like information on stations, so what should I expect when I get there? Are there gonna be staff? How big are the entrances? How many different, um, uh, platforms are there? How long is it going to take me to walk through a platform? How deep underground are we going to be going? Um, is it going to be completely dark in the tunnels? Um, things like prices. Public transport can often have the most complex pricing system of anything in existence. Uh, making, being able to find out exactly how much your journey is going to cost and how you can pay for it. So needing to know, for example, if I get on a bus here in London, you're not even allowed to pay with cash, you'll be using a card. Um, in most parts of the country, you're going to need to have cash, and often they want you to have exact change. Um, that's something you're going to want to know before you get on the bus. Um, information at stations and stops, being able to find out, even if you don't have a phone with you or you're not uh, that au fait with technology, being able to find out um, at the station or at the bus stop that you're at how you can get to where you're going, which buses run from there, where they're going, where they terminate. Um, 
there's also this, this really important aspect, clear people to contact for help. So there's been a lot of discussion about technology uh, today, which is really, really key. And often for an autistic person, where going up to a, to a stranger can be quite challenging, technology can be really important. But that doesn't mean that autistic people won't benefit from having other humans that they can interact with and benefit from and, and get information from. That's absolutely not the case. And often it's those people who can be the most helpful because they can be flexible to the very specific request that you have. And we don't yet have technology which can absolutely understand your exact predicament. Um, probably won't for many decades, but people can listen to a query and understand that exact request. So I've put up email, phone and Twitter Twitter is a really convenient way that I've used when living in Oxford, commuting to London, uh, being able to use Twitter to find out what's going on in this situation. Twitter, you get an instant response as long as it's during reasonable hours of the day. It's quite different to an email, which has to be monitored. And of course, a phone, which may be, quite, may be creating quite a lot of anxiety, having to talk to someone on the phone. Um, also being able to prepare for and help to deal with difficult situations. There's nothing, there's no amount of technology, no amount of innovation is going to make trains and buses never be delayed and never have cancellations and never have diversions. That's impossible. But what we can do to help autistic people, to support autistic people when that happens, to recognize that they may be panicking, is to making sure that we have trained staff who know how to support those people, making sure that when you declare a cancellation or delay, that information is the information is immediately available of what the alternative is, not just throwing the problem, but also throwing the solution out there as well. This is my experience where I've lived, uh, particularly up in the northwest when I was commuting uh, four miles each day to go to school, um, and the, the challenges that I faced then. Limited information on the site. Uh, if there is information on the site at all, it's takes a very long time to find it and it's not clearly signposted. It's all based on what should happen, which with buses is never the case. There's no live timetables. Sometimes at the bus stops in the village where I live, they could be two or three years out of date. So the bus timetable on the, on the stop is telling me one thing. And the last time I went home, I actually went to a bus stop which was still there, which actually no longer is used by any buses, but it still had a timetable at the bus stop and a full shelter for the bus. Um, no trained staff, so for example if a bus breaks down, the bus driver is going to be probably quite irate, probably having to deal with their own level of stress, and they won't know how to deal with somebody who might be panicking. Um, and finally, no live contact details. So you can email, so I can be at the stop and no bus has turned up for 15 minutes and I can send an email. I'm not going to use the phone because I'm already too anxious for that. But I'm going to receive a response in two days. That's no use to me. I'm not going to stay at the bus station for two days. Um, and finally, I've gone the good, the bad, and this is the ugly. This is the real results that this can have. And I think some people have talked about the importance of public transport uh, in people's lives. Um, it's not just uh, some, uh, a chore that we have to do. It's something that can open um, an autistic person, can open me to the world, can give me an opportunity um, to work, to go out with friends, to meet people, to study. Um, at school until I was 15, I never stayed out with friends after school because I didn't understand how the buses worked after school finishing time. I could catch the half past three bus, I could catch the four o'clock bus. I could not stay out past then to go to the cinema, to go to the shops with my friends because I didn't know how those buses worked and my parents were, too, were either working or otherwise I'd have to inconvenience them. If the bus broke down, I'd panic, I'd call my parents, I would stress them out, and I'd stress myself out. It would, it would be an inconvenience to everyone, when actually there may have been a perfectly good alternative just around the corner that I didn't know about and no one was telling me about. And so the key, the sort of way that I summarize it is that here in London, when I use public transport, I feel like an adult. I feel like somebody who can go and meet my friends independently. I can go to work independently. I can go to events like this independently. When I go home, I feel like a child again, even at the age of 23. I still feel like a child. And by the time I live in a village, as I say, four miles from my nearest town where my friends live, and I often don't arrange to see any friends. Even if I'm home for more than a week, I won't arrange to see any friends from school that I knew several years ago. Because by the time I arrive in the town, I'm so stressed out, I've had to go through such an ordeal, it's been such a process, that I don't actually 
have the energy or the inclination to spend time with my friends. All I want to do is hop right back on the bus and go home. So, what can you do? What other things that would be, be beneficial for us? Well, phone, email, and Twitter contacts, as I mentioned before. But particularly useful could be a named contact with autism friendly training. One thing we, we encourage people to do, as I encourage people to do as part of my role, is to have a named con somebody who is particularly an ex has particular expertise on autism in the organisation. They may most likely will be somebody who is a disability champion more generally and has quite a lot of useful knowledge, who you know can be a named contact, who you can contact, and you know that not only are they there to answer your question, but they understand why you might be having that stress or you might be worried about this thing, which not many people do worry about. Or some friendly tri training for some drivers and station staff, but also understanding for all staff. We understand that you're not going to be able to train every member of staff that you have in autism, but there may be a way of giving some really basic information, just maybe just an overview of what autism is and how it affects people. That could be a video clip or a short article, because even if you don't know exactly how to deal with a situation, if you have a bit more empathy and a bit more understanding and you can stop and think, maybe this isn't just a naughty child or an adult who's behaving strangely, but actually somebody who could benefit from just being able to sit down, have a quiet space, then you could really make a difference. Um, guides on the site, uh, both website and physical sites, um, so stations and systems, how it works, alternative routes and plans, uh, and information on arrivals and changes. So you immediately can find out what the next stop is, why you're diverting and where to, and so on. I think the golden rules are that small changes can make a big impact. You don't need to change the world or spend lots of money in order to help your autist autistic customers and their parents and carers, and there are 2.8 million of them. Changes which are helpful for autistic people are often helpful for all your customers, improving your customer service overall. Changes like when I get on a bus, I know exactly which stop is coming up each time. I can, I'm pretty confident that pretty much everyone in this room has found that useful at some point. But that particularly has been beneficial for me as an autistic person. Why should we? Why should we worry about this? Well, as I said, 2.8 million autistic people, parents and carers in the UK. This is a huge market. It's also, it not only is it a huge market economically, but it's also a huge number of people whose lives, who may be socially isolated or whose lives could be opened up. And the opportunity to make a difference to that large number of people, to me, is very exciting. Uh, products and technology to make public transport better for everyone, not just for autistic people. Um, and that's especially true, I think, once you consider all the different disabilities um, and the changes you can make across the piece. Um, City Mapper and Move It are very big uh, companies, companies that are doing very well for themselves. But as has been mentioned, um, things like City Mapper aren't necessarily accessible for other disabilities. I personally find it very useful, um, but for other disabilities, it's not as useful. Who can make something that innovates for other people as well? Who can make a city mapper that can work even if you're in the middle of rural Cheshire and not just in the centre of London? And uh, transport suitable for autistic people means less meltdowns and stresses, happier customers and an inclusive customer service. If, so, if somebody on a bus who is autistic is having a meltdown, nobody on that bus is enjoying that journey. But if you can make an autistic person's journey comfortable, then you have a more pleasant transport experience for everyone. And most importantly, it could make the difference between an autistic person taking a train or a bus. Instead of paying for a taxi, which, as has already been mentioned, many autistic people, 85% uh, of autistic people aren't in full-time employment, more likely to be low income. That's probably not an accessible option. Um, needing car lifts everywhere, being more dependent on parents and carers, or even not going out at all and that creating social isolation, not just for the autistic person, but for their fa f uh, family and carers. So I want to say thank you because it's really wonderful to see the changes that have happened over the past 10 years um, while I've been growing up and now that I'm in the world of work. Um, and I know that it makes a difference um, and I know that it will continue to. So I'm very grateful to those of you who are making those changes and um, thank you very much.